products for Xerox based on the star interface and a biologically inspired behavior engine for virtual worlds called Nerves. Bruce is the author of Avatars, Exploring and Building Virtual Worlds on the Internet. And he's currently working on another book and developing a cyber biological community on a farm in Santa Cruz Mountains known as the Digital Garden. Bruce holds an MSEE from the University of Southern California. He formerly served as chief technologist at Elixir Technologies and as a member of the Charles University Prague Math and Physics faculty. Bruce is also a founding member, is also a founding board member of the International Academy of Networked Arts and Technology, a Silicon Graphics Vanguard of Visual Computing, a member of the staff of SFSU Multimedia St Studies Program, and a visiting scholar at the University of Washington Human Interface Technology Laboratory. And Bruce is here today to introduce us to the new frontier of virtual communities. I'm, uh, I was just playing Steve's uh, introduction into my avatar in cyberspace. Uh, uh, this is what I look like this morning. I don't know what, uh, what you guys look like, but I had a, a late night. So, um, we're in a room here with some wonderful people in a virtual world called On Life Traveler, hosted in Boulder, Colorado. And I'm going to, to switch to my uh, frontal view and show you who's here with us. Hey, guys. Hi, Jewel. We're, we're just fine. Thank you for all coming out. And uh, why don't you say good morning, CASCON? Good morning, CASCON. <laughs> so, so who, who, who all's here in the coffee shop? Hey, Gail Ann, how's it in there in Wisconsin? You remember? Uh, actually, it's pretty good. No snow yet. So what you're what you're seeing here is you <laughs> this is a, a virtual world that runs uh, people through their modems at home are talking and their voices are streaming in to this space. The phonemes are being taken out and the avatars are lip-syncing uh, and speaking their own voices. And it's also spatialized so that the farther away you are, the farther away you are from somebody, the, uh, the less you can hear, and it's also in stereo. So it was designed to, to run on ordinary PCs at home without any hardware acceleration. So this is one of the great achievements of the team at, at OnLive Technologies. How am I doing, Jewel? You're doing good. So, Jewel, why do you why do you like to be an avatar? Why do you like to uh, change your persona and come into cyberspace like this? Um, I like it because of the fact that um, I'm homebound right now, and, and it's difficult for me to get out and about. And I've made a lot of really great friends and travelers. Um, typing isn't my thing. I'm not, I'm not a big typer. I really enjoy being able to talk to people. You get to know more about people when you can hear the emotion in their voices and, um, and hear their, their accents and their inflections and whatnot. Tell, tell, um, tell everybody to, uh, to roll their heads. Let's do some morning calisthenics here. All right, y'all. Look at your size, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, who am I batting with my tail? You can, you can. You, you don't have a tail. You are a head. You can hear people uh, banging into me because there's oh, body oh contact. God. Okay, now everybody give the crowd a big smile.
Gillian, give us a big smile. I'm tired. Um, you might want to try a different one with that one. Does the audience have any questions for the avatars? Yeah, surprise. <laughs> okay. Oh boy, look at that sad cat. Of course, I can just pick my own. Uh, my own expressions too. Ooh, I'm happy to be on stage here. Vote for me. <laughs> Bruce Damer for president. Woohoo! <laughs> I run for president okay. of Virtual Worlds. There we go. Well, guys, you want to do a, a song for us uh, before we have to leave Traveler and go over to Active Worlds? Sure. Hey, why don't we do, um, hey, guys, why don't we row, row, row your boat? Because that'll carry out um, the, 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 the couple of seconds away that goes on. Y'all up for it? Sure. Oh, <laughs> okay. I guess I'll start. Y'all cut in whatever you want. They're going to oh, use oh, the oh, delay. Oh, your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Merrily, life is but a dream. Row, row your boat gently down the stream. <laughs> Lightning bolt doing a John Wayne version of it. <laughs> <laughs> question from the question from the audience. Gail Ann, great question from the audience. Um, how do you feel about being in voice avatars and not, and then being able to be identified as, as a woman or a man um, and not having so much anonymity? Whoops. Um, I like it for the fact that the, it deletes the initial questions of, you know, and, and their typical questions, you know, Male or female, age, height, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> People are able to, to get into more uh, constructive conversations faster, I believe. Would you all agree with that? Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except when a guy takes a woman's avatar. <laughs> True. There are cross dressers. Well, thank. Uh, I'll tell you why I like th traveling. Thank you guys very much for for talking to our audience. Uh, I think here in this world, nobody really wants to be anonymous. I think maybe that be the answer. We're going to flip over to, to Active Worlds. If you want to come over to Active Worlds, we'll be in the Avatar 98 Conference Hall. And again, thank you very much. And here, here the audience should uh, give them a round of applause. You all get that? Yeah, we got it. Tell people to come and see us. <laughs> Tell them to come and see us. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Okay, guys, we'll see you later on. 
Toodaloo. Bye-bye, Bruce. Have a good day. Adios. Come, come back. Okay, well, that was one world, one, one community. I'm just going to go, we're going over to another world. And this, this world is, supports, uh, I'm going to turn on our sound here now. This world is based on, uses text chat. Let's see what we've got here. <laughs> Um, where I am right now. Oh, thanks, guys. That, that's good. Maybe a little bit of, a little bit of sound from that. Uh, this is a world called Active Worlds, which our organization, which is an organization called the Contact Consortium. Uh, we use all these worlds. We're a nonprofit membership. I'm just telling them we're starting. I had booked a bunch of people to come in here today for you. Okay, and there's a bunch of people there. Um, what you're seeing here, I'll just go into this. this. is a world where the avatars are full body and don't have uh, the ability to do lip syncing. Uh, and it's a world of text chat, which means that it actually runs on just about any computer in the world, even low end, even on 486s. Uh, with voice, you really suck up bandwidth. But what you're seeing here in this crowd, this is a, a crowd of bots, uh, which are like embodied agents, uh, unembodied agents. The background sound is sort of crowds and noise from, from the conference hall. But these bots uh, are being driven by a fellow named Hamphone, who's over there. And I'll say, okay, Ham, let him rip and he's driving all these characters for us and they at our con we held a conference inside this world on November 21st we had 4,000 people here and so this army of bots that are not representing a person they're representing scripted software marched around and helped people out uh, questions and answers took people on tours uh, did performances etc and they happen to be using a large variety of, of avatars, uh, but they're not, they're not people, whereas Ham over here is. Ham's a security expert in Kansas City. There he is here, standing by the help desk. Okay, we're just waiting for the, oh, there they go, okay. So the, this is sort of a marching formation. He's driving all these bots, uh, to do various marches. Sarge looks like he's that skimpy. Well, I suppose can, women can be sergeants too now. So. But there they go, they're doing some sort of a, a formation. And this is an innovation of the user community. Uh, the user community created uh, uh, the ability to drive avatars auto automatically and process the people's text. So, okay, so we're getting a little performance here. And there's probably eight or nine real people in avatars watching this. I'm going to go out of my body. Most of these virtual worlds provide you out of body views so you can watch from overhead. And this, uh, now I'm over the conference uh, hall center. This is me. As conference chair, I got a really nice, very uh, threatening avatar. So I could go around and tell speakers they were uh, not on schedule. and things like that, and it actually has my face on it, which is kind of unusual for, for Avatar Worlds, and I can wave. So I'm a little higher than everybody. Every conference chair should have one of these. <laughs> so there, oh, there's the sort of uh, biz droid march there. They don't have any briefcases. They're all looking at their watches. Uh, it can be confusing. People say, well, is that a real person or is that, is that a bot? And 
Uh, over their heads, you can see a square brackets uh, where their names are, and that d indicates that they're not a person. There's a whole bunch more students. Okay, student volunteers. So what I'm going to do now We're going to take us all on a tour of the hall. And let, because we're trying to truly avatar worlds are a brand new medium of human communication. People would, some people would say, well, gee, it's just chatting on the net and meeting your mate. Um, or it's just sort of wasting time. And, or playing games. You, know, you might be in Quake or Ultima or whatnot on quests and doing games. But these particular worlds where people come to socialize, uh, where they used to use teletype type chat environments, where you just had a chat room, these worlds are where people come to build cities and to try whole sort of utopian experiments and to try to work together and do business together and to learn together. Uh, so it's moved beyond this sort of simple chat you know, interface, social interface, to, to an entire medium of being with other people. Uh, and one of the interesting things is how does this uh, medium tie in with what we're used to? I'm going to tell them, let's all, I'm going to tell Ham thanks for the show. I will take them to the webcams for a sec. And I'll say, hi, Michelle. There's a PhD student just dropped in. She's documenting um, the emergence of this particular world for her dissertation at Ohio State. So I'm going to click on this. Uh, this is kind of fun. I'm going to click on this uh, warper, and that carries my body at high speed, about 300 meters from the central landing area to the broadcast area. And this is where we had. And what happens as I'm going is the this world streams 3D, and so the world can be huge. It can have millions of objects. It doesn't really make any difference on the download time. It's not like, say, a VRML environment where you have to wait for the entire scene graph to load, the entire geometry to load. It's active worlds, which is what we're using here, is a very well-architected uh, environment. This is CNN's live feed. Uh, MTV participated in the event, so they have uh, MTV throughout uh, the conference floor. But there's uh, somebody's very interesting webcam there. And we've got about 15 webcams um, showing, in this case, they were showing locations where we had, we had 40 physical locations around the planet in this conference. The theme of the conference was virtual world cyberspace, it's here, what are we going to do with it? And so people projected their, their physical locations. There's another very interesting webcam view. Um, this is my farm in Santa Cruz Mountains, and that's kind of uh, the last image that we broadcast on the 21st during the Avatar Awards. But this is other uh, Zelda, the PhD student who's coming. She's always following us around with a notepad. I think she's an anthropologist or something. So that's the broadcast area. That's where we put the, the so-called real world into the virtual world. And there was usually about 50, 60 avatars or people standing here watching the broadcast because sometimes they see people that they had never met. They didn't know who, what they looked like. They had met them in the world for years, but they didn't know what they looked like. So they were standing here waiting for people to come on camera. So there's Zelda. So I can go up to her and ask her how her dissertation's going. In fact, I'm going to change. I'm going to change into a less domineering avatar. There we are. So now I'm, I'm out of my body. Now I'm kind of this student-like character here. <laughs> how is your dissertation going? She's doing, she has permission to, do, to capture all our text. She doesn't know she's on the big screen, I think. But I have no idea what she looks like either, but I'll tell her you are on screen. Slow, but it's moving again. Okay, that sounds like a, a dissertation. 
Okay, join us for the tour of the exhibits. We're going to go to the exhibits. Oh, she's running out of time. Actually, that's an idling gesture uh, where the, she looks at, at her watch. And I'm going to go out of body and zoom back here. And uh, the people at MIT Media Lab that um, are studying avatars are quite critical of the idling gestures that have the watches constantly telling you, I'm busy. But it's just a, there's a sort of a gesture pattern. And if you're not, if you're not selecting a gesture, um, like I can select the gesture happy. And this avatar was made by a teenager, so you can see the happy and the angry are, are very teen-like. <laughs> That's like a fight. That's a fight, yeah. So it's funny because they applied those gestures to uh, Bizman, too. And uh, he does the same thing, you know. He goes, oh, more, more middle management layoffs, you know. <laughs> So these virtual worlds are, are gradually getting more and more and more populated. I'm going to show you a, quite an interesting image here to show you the scale. I think this NT system is about to give up the ghost here. There we go. Um, just to give you an idea of the, the scale of what's happening, this is one of the cityscapes of, the, of one of the virtual worlds in this complex. There's about 600 worlds in the complex. And what you're seeing is an overhead sort of satellite image view of the stuff that people built homesteading. Uh, many of the worlds have, say, a billion hectares of real estate, and you can just sort of walk out into the middle of nowhere take objects that you find lying around in the world and put them together and build houses and stadiums and parks and garbage dumps and whatever people want to build, including an airport, which is right here. This is a, an airport. Now, it was built by 12-year-old kids, and it has 50,000 parts. And why did they build an airport? You know, it, nobody knows, but when they took the satellite image of the cityscape, uh, two years ago, the airport appeared, and then people started to use this as a clickable map and drop down uh, onto, onto the airfield and say, here we are. Uh, we built a town called, uh, called Sherwood Forest Town, which is, if you can see where I'm putting the mouse, it's right here, with the anthropologists building an old English village and studying it, writing papers about it and whatnot. And we thought we'd built some enormous structure and then the, the map was published, and we saw that there was this enormous suburb right next to us of these, these grid streets. And I, I said, now I know why. There was one day that this 12-year-old boy came up to the gates of Sherwood and said, I want to buy all this land. And he had a bot next to him, this big yellow bot. And he said, this is my bot. He's going to put streets right through here. I'm, I want to buy your land. I said, that's too late. You no, know, we were here before you. And he, he got miffed, and he and his bot went off. And he had actually used that bot to build a, that street pattern and, and to cover over all those properties and then sell them. I think he sold them for labor. And he filled up that, that suburb. So he was sort of a levit of cyberspace. Uh, but uh, he was going to bulldoze us over, except that we already had, uh, we already had rights to the objects that we placed down. This cityscape was built by some of about 200,000 people. Uh, the demographics are anywhere from five years old to retiree, retired architects who still have a craving to, to build things. Um, and whole families go into these worlds and build houses and structures together, you know, families that aren't together. Grandfathers work with grandchildren to build projects. And 200,000 users in the Polygon budget of this world and the collective is almost a billion polygons, uh, which is, if you, any of you are in 3D graphics, is a very, very large, very, very large number. 
So we're going to go back into the world. One of the things, one of the properties of these worlds is that you, you build a whole lot of stuff and it becomes, in a sense, a ghost town. And one, one of the things the Contact Consortium does in my company, Digital Space, is we're trying to put meaning into these environments. And it turns out that um, okay, I just picked something by mistake. It turns out that if you put a lot of structure into any place, you get you get a lot better results. If you if, if you tell people uh, a random group of people now we're organized into a, into a game or an exercise, we're going to do this for a day. People are very much more happy. They've got some sort of structure. You know, any kindergarten teacher will tell you that. Uh, so what we decided to do. Ah, I know, the bots are slowing us down, probably. Okies. Oops, I'm spelling things wrong. Um, they think I'm talking, I just can't see the keyboard. Let's tour the exhibits. Um, so what we decided to do was try to hold a full-on conference uh, for the users and the researchers and the companies that are using these worlds. So this is the conference floor. The building is a kilometer by a kilometer of, of mostly empty, actually. We filled maybe about 10% of that. And I'm going to go to the, the exhibition hall. In the exhibition hall, we can either walk there. The um, ham phones bots are, are starting to talk here or we can use this conference directory. Just like a traditional conference, we said, okay, we're going to have a directory and then there's an exhibitor list. And I think I'm going to go to the, the Boeing booth. And I don't know if any of you know Richard Wojcik. He's involved in the CSCW community. Um, they had a, a participation here because they used these worlds to try to uh, find out how Boeing can use them. So I'm going to click on Boeing Direct Teleport and land in front of the Boeing exhibit. So this is during the, the big day on November 21st. Boeing people were standing here. And as the thousands of people were going by down this particular aisle, um, Boeing was saying, OK, we're, we're going to have a discussion on the virtual corporation you know, in, in an hour. And they had a big crowd come into their virtual world, which is sort of behind. There was a teleporter to take people into their virtual world to talk about the use of these worlds in training uh, and in collaboration within Boeing. Walking down the exhibit floor a little bit, this was the uh, United Nations, the Food and Agriculture Organization. And they are thinking of using this kind of world in cyberspace for world awareness days, like food hunger awareness days. So this was the FAO in, in Rome. And let's go over to Compaq. There's Compaq Computer. IBM wasn't here, my gosh. Uh, that's an, uh, an architecture institute in uh, London. This is biota.org, which is an interesting organization, um, part of the Contact Consortium. And actually, if I click here, and if all goes well, I'll get uh, a real video um, click on this little TV, you get a, uh, a real video stream. Here it comes, hopefully. So in the booth, people would have themselves standing there and talking to people. They could have bots standing there saying, you know, fill out the form and get a free T-shirt. Because the web here on the right, uh, people can click on an object and get a web page to come up on the right. So people could fill out uh, forms. And so here we are hopefully connecting and pulling in. Yeah, there it is. This was a real video uh, stream from a television program on Discovery Canada um, by Jay Ingram, who was the keynote here last year. And so that's a way to tie in. It was an event we held up in the Canadian Rockies at the Burgess Shale last year to look at the origins of life and emergent complexity in, in these worlds. That's Carl Sims. So it was a way to tie, to tie together um, 
video and audio content into the exhibit floor. So oh, somebody just sent me a telegram. And they're saying any more, anything more? All can join me if you like. One more uh, interesting booth to show you is the United is the uh, Orange County Convention Center. I'll just go over there. Actually, here's another here's another lab. Pacific Northwest Labs, Battelle National Laboratories in in Washington, and it's a federal research lab, and they're doing a lot of research in uh, co-laboratories. Uh, this this table that looks like sort of high-end Scrabble is their sort of collab table. So they're using virtual worlds. Here, there's Hamphone. They're using virtual worlds to, to experiment uh, with scientific collaboration. This is uh, the Seth Doby, known as Raven in the world, who built uh, the avatars that do the real high school kind of moves. So he got a, fr he got a free booth for all his work. And we'll go over to the Orange County Convention Center. And this is kind of funny because they called us up about four days before the show to book a booth. And we said, why are you guys here? He said, hey, you know, if we're holding SIGGRAPH here at the convention center, we can hold a virtual SIGGRAPH and have all the exhibitors and have the speakers' uh, voices beamed into a virtual world and have 100,000 people at the virtual SIGGRAPH and 50,000 people at the SIGGRAPH here. So we're actually going to be starting to build digital space. My company will be starting to build worlds for them. Um, and look at how they put it was really funny here. Um, cyberspace is just the beginning. Look at our new expansion. And they're, spe they're spending $400 million to become the world's largest convention center. And they, they're pointing out, they're, they're already feeling threatened here. We host over 1.1 million real square feet of exhibition space. <laughs> so, looking at the orange that's Orange County, Florida, by the way. So this is, this is just one example. Actually, since we're, we're all conference goers, I'll tell you now to Big Board. We're all conference attendees. I'm a habitual conference goer. So let's go over to the, uh, how we did the conference program. You, know, you always get a book at a conference. Uh, by the way, this is a, a scene here of a big crowd on the right. This is a web page on the right of a really big crowd at, at the exhibition hall, Ground Zero. You can sort of see them there. So that's typically what you'll see uh, when there's a, the, the browser, there's actually 400 people here, but the browser's only showing you the closest 50. Otherwise, your, your rendering speed would go to zero. But that's a typical crowd. And let's go down and uh, do the clickable map. So we kind of did, you know, every conference has got this sort of map to the event. This is our clickable map. And you can see this image here is the so-called big board. And this is a reference to the uh, novel Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. It's which depicted a cyberspace full of avatars, a 3D cyberspace. And this is our conference schedule board. Next time, we're also going to have one of those little post-it notes board where people can leave the memos for, you know, I'm lost, where were you, meet me at the restaurant kind of things. But here's a good example of how you do a, a conference program. And I can sort of float myself around that board. And there are sort of people standing, speakers are actually standing by their track and screening down into the world and saying, come to our track. And there were people down there and click, click here and come to my track. Because we built breakout session rooms called pods. If I click here, it'll actually drive us to the pod. We're actually being pummeled through cyberspace to a distant location where the, the voices, the text chat doesn't overlap, uh, which is quite important because if you've got a thousand people in, in an exhibit hall and they're all talking, you've got to put your speaker uh, 
session pods uh, quite far from that so they don't, they don't overlap. So this is the uh, educator's track that was held um, pretty much for about six hours. And these are the presenters. And this is really well done. This was done by Bonnie DeVarco at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And these are, the, these are the presenters. This is Derek Woodham from University of Cincinnati. And I think that's Margaret Corbett there from Cornell. So we go into the very regal, very uh, beautiful uh, track area for the speakers. And the speakers, would, the speakers stood here. I'm going to tell everybody to join me. I can actually put out a put out a message here. Oh yeah, just, she's just joining me. Okay, so she's joining you. Hey, I'll tell her we're reenacting this. We are reenacting the pod. She was here all day taking notes when the speakers were up on stage. And what they did, uh, they had bots capturing all their discussions. And I'll, I'll bring up the, the, the transcript. So we, talking about having a, a, a proceedings for a conference. This is how we did our proceedings. And remember that none of this has ever been done before. Here we go. So this is Margaret Corbett's track, and they had a bot recording uh, all their sessions. So for instance, somebody was doing screenshots, doing photographs, and this is the session here. These are all the participants. And there they all standing in the, uh, in the pod. And there's Margaret with, uh, someone was changing her slides back behind her. She's trying, trying to found a virtual science center at Cornell. And, and there she is looking at her slides so, you can read, so she can read them to, to the people there, talking about the Cornell program. And there's the real Mars, and they're looking at their work with, they do a lot of work with the Pathfinder mission. But this was just an excellent session. It's sort of a, of a portent for things to come in these virtual conferences. And that's a bio for Margaret. So it, it gives you an idea of uh, that there's potentially great power here for pedagogical use. Now, what did she just say? Hope every everyone's had their coffee this morning. <laughs> uh, to tell you a couple of of stories of the use of this in learning spaces. Stanford University in the spring is going to be starting to use this particular type of world for, a, there's a lab in civil engineering called the PBL, Process Based Learning Lab. And it's funded by companies like Bechtel, construction companies. And those companies come to Stanford and they say, we can give you 10 million more dollars because we, we love Stanford and we love what you're doing, but you have to give us students who come out of engineering who have been through, in some simulated sense, the hell of putting up a building, of dealing with city authorities, of contractors that screw up on deliveries, or, or contractors that disappear, uh, or failures at the work site, or weather changes, or dealing with the very different personality of a construction company boss and an architect, trying to keep, to keep them placated. We need people who've been through that terrible experience of putting, you know, every building is a nightmare. You know, every project is, is and so the process-based learning lab, what we're going to be building for them is pods like the one you're seeing here, where the students will gather every week, and most of the students are, are remote from campus. They'll gather every week, and they'll have their discussions, they'll have their record taken, they'll have images put on the walls, models brought in, and outside the window in the distance will be the building going up, piece by piece by piece. And then every week that the students meet for the, for the entire eight-month project term, you'll see the building getting more built and more stuff on it and newspaper stands where it says, crisis at building site in our city, you know, and suddenly somebody's written a story that's gotten to the paper that's bad press for the building site and the students will arrive and 
the building's more built by the construction crew, but there's all these things. And then they'll have to go into their dis discussion pod and say, oh boy, bring all the stuff from last time. Now we've got a whole new situation. You know, we've got a lawsuit by the neighborhood or something like that. And then at the end, where and we'll have real construction company bosses involved who will be in the simulation and be, can come in and say, aha, now, okay, your granite supplier is gone. And now you have to use this granite sheeting, facing, but all the holdfasts are in, the, in different places. Figure it out. You're in the middle of construction. You have to change everything. And the, uh, the builder is now upset because they're going to be three weeks late and they're going to lose $70,000 a day in, loss in tenant fees, overdue fees. So at the end of the term, at the end of this project, they will have a record of all the decisions they made and they'll be able to walk, walk the building as it goes up in four dimensions, almost a dimension through time, and walk through the entire process of why did we do what we did. And when those students graduate from Renata Fruchter's lab, they're going to really have a sense of what is involved in, in constructing buildings. So Bechtel will give her another $10 million. So it, this is, uh, watch for a presentation on this if you're at Stanford in March. The, the department's holding a conference and we're going to be showing this. Another example of using these worlds in learning uh, came completely from outside any school or, or university. Uh, a boy named Brian from Birmingham, Alabama contacted us during our Sherwood Forest experiment two, two, two three years ago and said, I want to learn how to build. I'm 13. And we showed him how to build and he was sort of a successful plot owner at Sherwood Forest. And then we said, okay, Brian, what are you gonna do now? Well, I'm going off, I'm building a floating city called Sky City. It's gonna be floating at the high altitude. I said, I didn't know you could do that. Oh yeah, you can build really high up. You can't see it, but you can teleport there. And after about six months, Brian telegrammed me in the world and said, oh, if they're saying greetings IBMers, um, telegrammed me and said, uh, come and see Sky City, and I kind of put it off for a couple of months, and then I finally went to Sky City, and it was magnificent. They had a meeting hall, they had a subway that took you around the, the city. It was something like 100,000 parts. It was a couple of kilometers long. It was a very large structure. I said, how many people worked on this? I said, oh, boys and girls about my age, all over the world, maybe 15. And I said, well, what did you learn, Brian? What did you learn for being in this world for a year and building this city? And I thought he was going to say, well, I learned about like 3D on the internet. And he didn't say that. He said, I learned about people. I said, oh, people. What happened? And he said, we had a fight. <laughs> I said, oh. Well, he said, you remember when I telegrammed you six months ago, uh, into it and when, when I said, come and see it and you didn't show up? Well, we were in the middle of a fight. And, and two boys who were from the quake world want to tear apart the city. You build it, you trash it. And they were trashing it. They were coming in. They had common building privileges. And when, they, when nobody else was looking, they were coming in and trashing the city. And it was all dismembered and it was terrible. It was all these parts floating like Battlestar Galactica blowing up. And when the city was 50% destroyed, Brian called an emergency meeting. And for 24 hours, they had to deal with all these time zones. There was boys from Israel. And they stood in a circle of avatars, kind of like we are now. And they voted. You know, they they voted happy or angry. They voted yes or no. We keep the city for, oh, hey, hey, wait a minute. This is the winning avatar from the Avi Awards. Her name is Summer and she has a rabbit. <laughs> anyway, she's very nice. I'll let you look at her when I, as I finish this story. She's got all these butterflies. 21K, folks. Um, Anyway, uh, sorry to distract you. Uh, <laughs> so they had a vote, and they voted to keep Sky City going. And the two boys that were destroying it felt very bad, and they said, we're sorry we hurt your feelings, and they left the project. And they rebuilt the city, and they did a better job. Um, Brian said, we did a better job. I said, what else did you learn? Uh, well, I learned that you have to keep people coming back. You have to keep them wanting to come back. You have to know when to stop. You have to know you can't pile too many objects up in one place. Uh, you have to figure out a way to get people to come to the city after you've made it. And I said, Brian, guess what? You learned how to live in the 21st century. 
you learned how to run a global project with human resource problems, crises, budget, motivating people, and promoting the project. And it was a complex project, and he's 14 years old. And he said, cool. <laughs> and at one point, I had a call from his parents, and I said, because his father had called up to thank us for involving Brian in the project. I said, tell me some, one thing. Brian spent about 3,000 hours on this project. How did you deal with it? How does he, he deal with his schoolwork? And he said, we made a deal with Brian. He replaced his world time, he replaced TV with his world time. He just didn't watch TV for a year. And I said, well, that, that, he didn't seem to mind that. No, he didn't mind that at all. He was, he was sort of doing something productive. And then I said, well, well, how did it impact the family? And he said, it changed our family. I said, how did, how, how did that happen? Well, Brian's older brother, who's 17, who's a hacker, is a really that cool hacker guy, broke into the phone company computers in, in, in Alabama and everything, got in trouble. And he was the cool guy. And Brian was always in his shadow. Brian was sort of the little 13-year-old brother who was always in the shadow of the cool older brother. And Brian didn't want to do destructive things. He said, his father said, now that Brian's done something creative and he has newspaper reporters coming to talk to him about Sky City and he has teachers coming home to see Sky City and to meet the Israeli kids and the French kids and have the, the crowd in there, Brian's now on top of the heat. Brian did something creative and productive and he's got his self-esteem and you have helped our family immeasurably. So if there's anything that, that these worlds are good for, it's that type of personal experience that Brian uh, got in Birmingham, Alabama. And to kind of uh, sort of wind down a bit, I'm going to show you a couple things. I'm going to show you some really weird things. You didn't think these, these were weird? Uh, by the way, our, our home page, before I forget, is the Contact Consortium and it's at www.ccon.org. That's Charlie, Charlie, or Nancy, dot O-R-G. And my company, Digital Space, produced these worlds for the consortium membership. Consortium is a nonprofit membership research organization that, that is doing a lot of experiments. My book, this shameless promotion here, uh, tells you all about this. Um, it gives you all the worlds and all the software and everything. And it's actually on sale at the uh, Cascon bookstore uh, outside, and they've got about 15 copies. You, and I'd be happy to sign them. Shameless self-promotion. But um, what I'm going to do is show you a couple of other very bizarre things. One of the things that's happening inside virtual world cyberspace is a kind of emergence, a kind of complexity, uh, explosion of complexity, as you can see from that overhead map. Um, what we are seeing now is many of you are familiar with the artificial life field that tries to sort of put biological process and, and build simulation based on biological metaphors. Well, this is one of the great examples of emergence. These are creatures programmed in a connection machine by Carl Sims about eight years ago that evolved their own swimming behaviors. They start out with a very simple genetic set, a directed graph actually, and then properties of the world's viscosity and whatnot, and these swimming behaviors emerge. And these creatures evolve through competition with each other over millions and millions of, of, of iterations and generations. They would reproduce and, and evolve. And incredible forms would emerge, like these different walking forms. And people really love these creatures. They're sort of a, a gorilla form, this sort of very bizarre walking strategies. And these worlds are fascinating because this is hands-off, this is not programmed. These things just, just emerge um, based on, on rule sets. And what we did as an organization is said, let's try to do some emergence in cyberspace. So we formed this project called biota.org, which Carl and, and uh, many of the others are, are involved with. And we built a garden in cyberspace using something called L systems. Let's see if I can bring one of these gardens up. And it was saying, hey, we've got constructivist worlds like you saw in active worlds, social worlds, 
Uh, what about biological emergent worlds? And so we built uh, a system that allowed people to grow plants on islands in the net. And this is one of the islands grown at SIGGRAPH in 1997. And we're sort of traveling around it on a bee. And these islands are now being reprogrammed so that the, the plants uh, grow and change and the insects eat the plants. And there's an ecosystem uh, using nerves under the island. And one more application I think might interest you is an application in medicine. And we've got just barely enough time to run a videotape of Steven Spielberg introducing a world about three years ago called Starbright World uh, that was used in hospitals. And I think I'll let Steven uh, talk more about that. And I think we can maybe run, we'll run about uh, a few minutes of that. There we go. Hello, sound in the back, please. We have left to go between now and November when we go out there online with this. And so. <laughs> And, uh, so now you can see how Stephen is represented in cyberspace. Yeah, I, I, I guess you would have called E.T. a self-portrait. <laughs> now we've just entered the third of our three virtual environments here. This one, uh, for obvious reasons, called Skyworld. And we can dance around amongst the clouds. So, yeah, just keep swinging to your left. Okay, now we're going to talk to the bouncing ball. Hi, do you see me? Hi. So I see you the same way that uh, you see me. This is, uh, uh, yeah. and this is 400 miles away as we speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, these children are at Lucille Packard Hospital in Stanford right now. Okay. Hi, Fish. Hi. And uh, what's your name? Vanessa. Hi, I'm Steven, or E.P., as they call me sometimes. <laughs> okay, and where are you right now? By the castle. Okay. <laughs> I'd love to see what you look like, uh, what you really look like. Can I, can I see you? Yes. And I'm going to go down and click down on the camera, and we'll see what we can do. There we are. <laughs> Every home should not be without one of these, I'm telling you. <laughs> so tell me about yourself. I'm 13, and I have osteosarcoma. I like swimming and play softball. Okay, don't be shy. Just step up to the, to the intel fine. camera. There we go. <laughs> Hello. This is my mom. Okay, Hi, okay mom. that's that's it. Hi. Hi. Yeah, cut it there. And can you put the PC back on screen? So I think there's time for questions. And note that there is a workshop on all this happening today, after this session and all afternoon. So I think um, two or three questions we are allowed today. Are you all dumbstruck? <laughs> what does it run on? Uh, this, these worlds run on various platforms, PCs and Macs. This particular run runs on Windows on the client side and Unix and NT on the server side. Even Linux. By the way, we built virtual books. I don't know how many of you are interested in e-commerce, but we'll be talking about that in the workshop. We built a bookstore for borders and et cetera. Second question. Way in the back.
question was what was uh, what is being done to give access to these places uh, for people who are, are lower income or information poor. We have a, uh, had some projects going with the city of Oakland uh, with Jerry Brown, believe it or not. And I was going. I went to Africa. I went to Soweto uh, and several townships in Africa and Swaziland, and we actually put some of these things there because they were more robust than web surfing. You can get them to work at 9600 baud and 14.4 and they work on noisy lines when you can't get web pages. So we did some experiments there in linking uh, California schools with schools in, in South Africa to see if they could do some kind of joint projects. And that's sort of just beginning. Um, they have to, of course, have all the equipment and, and someone to maintain it, and that's the main cost. The software is that comes free, so it, uh, the cost is, is all the knowledge and the, and the support for these darn things. Uh, second question, third question. I think we're I think we're done. Well, give a big hand for the the bots and the real people in in the world. Well, first, Bruce, uh, thanks. It was very entertaining. Thank you. Uh, for anybody who has questions, there is a workshop after. Uh, we'll start probably a little bit later than the other workshops, but we'll get rolling and we'll have some of this online anyway. And e email me at uh, bdamer at ccon.org, B-D-A-M-E-R, and join in. You will be assimilated. <laughs> hard, hard bits. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, the half hour break and the workshops will start at 10.30. Uh, see you all there.